Good morning, good evening, wherever you may be around in this beautiful, fantastic, God-given world. I trust all is well. It's Sunday. It's the Lord's Day. And this is the day we will rejoice, we will sing his praises, we will worship and thank him for his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. It's July 4th. It's our country's Independence Day. So as you can see, I'm at home and I'll be celebrating with my family our 4th of July, which usually entails anything from hamburgers, hot dogs, steaks, something grilled, and of course, fireworks. Um, your day, I pray, will be full of spiritual fireworks and that God will just continue to enlighten you and grow you in his grace and his mercy. We're in 2 Kings chapter 18, verses 1 through 16, and we're being introduced to a new king today, King Hezekiah. And I guess to start, I, I, I just wanted to kind of, as I've been thinking about it, uh, leading up to uh, this king, that we have a, a country, Israel, here, that has seen judges, kings, and sadly, most of the kings are not godly kings. They're wicked, they're evil, they're self-centered, they're egotistical, they're doing things their way and not God's way. They're ignoring God, they're disobeying God. And remember, Israel was to be God's spokesperson, to be their, their lighthouse, their testimony, to introduce other countries, other nations, other people to the true and living God. Because even taking it back further before Israel even became a nation, people walked further and further away from God. God created all mankind. He created you and me, and he created past, present, and future individuals to walk with them, to talk with them, to have a friendship, a fellowship, a relationship with them. And man, many men, have chosen not to serve God, to not even know or acknowledge he exists. And Israel, the nation, was no exception. And as we look now at this King Hezekiah, we find a man who chooses to walk with God. And I, I guess I want to touch on some of those things that he did, those attributes, that characteristics that reflects the man, that tells us the heart of him, the soul of him, uh, his just desire to do and be and obey God. This chapter, or actually the first 16, I can break up into th three different sections. So I'm going to address the first section, the, sex the second section, and then the third. And again, drawing insights of who Hezekiah is, but more importantly, who we are as individuals and who God is and how God responds and re back, re reacts to our, our obedience or disobedience. Again, what, what makes a man choose God or not choose God? And um, maybe we'll get a little, gain a little insight into that through the to this study now of Hezekiah. Let's read. 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 1 reads, In the third year of Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel, Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old. That's young. That's young for any king to take on that responsibility of ruling and running a nation. He was 25 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. 29 for any king is a long time. Obviously, again, this was a, a godly man and God blessed him. We go on to read in verse 2, his mother's name was Abi, the daughter of Zechariah, and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. I want to stop right there. Uh, his mother is introduced. I mean, if you know anything about his father, Ahaz, he was a very, very, very wicked, evil king. He did not follow the ways of, of King David. He did not follow the commandments of Moses. He did not follow God. And yet we find his son, as we're going to read further on, did the exact opposite. And that, that kind of is amazing to me to think that he grew up in a, a home which was modeled by his father. Again, he's the, he's the up and coming king. And to watch and observe what his father did, was that, was that an inclination of he basically chosen his heart to say, I'm not going to do it that way. 
what I do find very fascinating that his mother is introduced here. And I don't think in every situation the mother is announced. And the fact in verse, uh, verse 2 where it says his mother's name was Abby, the daughter of Zechariah, the next word is and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Those two thoughts or there's the introduction of the mother and the thought of doing right, that and connects the two. His mother obviously had a very strong influence on his upbringing in the Lord. And that upbringing overshadowed anything that King Ahaz, his father, did. He did right in the eyes of the Lord. Remember in Judges where it says everyone did right in their own eyes? And we all do that. We all justify our actions or we have our own sense or foundation or what we think is right versus wrong. And you put 10 different people in a room and all of them will come up with 10 different scenarios of what is right and wrong. Well, the bottom line is there is only one right. It's the Lord's. He, the creator of, of all mankind, the creator of all the universes, the creator of everything, has a right way of doing it. And there is no other. And this man, Hezekiah, chose to do it the Lord's way and not his own way or not Ahaz's way or not any other individual's way. And that's something you and I, any individual, needs to contemplate, think on. And we find God's right way in his word, the Bible. We find God's right way by acknowledging he exists and that uh, showing a desire and a willingness to do it his way, finding it in the Bible, finding it through the Holy Spirit, finding it through godly wisdom and testimony of other individuals, as in this case, his mother. He did right, according to all that David, his father, had done. David modeled godly, uh, well, got, got, got the heart of David modeled godly living. He removed the high places and broke the pillars and cut down the Azra. And he broke in pieces the bronze servant that Moses had made. For until those days, the people of Israel had made offerings to it. It was called Nahuthen, which translation means piece of brass. So we see not only doing right, he choosing to do right, we see, uh, we see action as well. And he knew that these false idols, these altars, these false altars, these false statues, this false belief system was wrong. And he took action. He cut down those pillars, those, 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 those statues that, that Israel had been worshiping through other Israelite kings. He saw the, the wrongness in it. And he, he did something about it. That takes bravery. That takes courage. I mean, uh, the politicians of our day uh, they are easily swayed, but this man was not. He did right before the Lord. He knew that worshiping false idols was wrong. It was in Moses' commandments. You're familiar with the Ten Commandments. Do not worship false gods. He took it to heart. He took it to action. Interesting, too, uh, it speaks of that bronze servant. Remember when Moses was walking through uh, the, the, the whole Israelite nation was walking through the wilderness and they were mumbling and complaining and he crafted this, this bronze uh, serpent and held it up and said, whoever looks on it shall be healed. This is like hundreds, I don't want to say 800 years later, they took that statue and made it into an idol and were worshiping it. We've got to be careful. We've got to stay focused on God and discern what is right and wrong and not take things or images of any kind and worship them. We worship a God who lives and is alive and well in our hearts and our souls. He broke it into pieces. Enough, he said, done. This is the exact opposite of what all the other kings, with I believe the exception of Asa, Asa did. So many other kings had come before him after David. 
And he is only, I believe, the second king to do what is right in the eyes of the Lord. He trusted in the Lord. So first we see he did right in the Lord, but also now we see he trusted in the Lord. And I, I want to just talk a little bit about that as well. You know, there's something to define the word trust, and I put four, to, four words together to, to define trust. First of all, in order to put your, uh, your reliability or dependence in another individual, in this case, the true and living God, there needs to be a consistency on that person, or in this case, God. And God has been consistent throughout time, from the beginning of time. He has proven himself. He's not wavered off. If he says he's going to do something, he does something. He has fulfilled promises, lived by them, followed through with them, regardless of what man has done. If you look in the word of God, if you see it in your own lives, you will recognize and realize the consistency of God. He, he's, you know what he's going to do. Another one, another word for trust, in addition to consistency, I wrote down compassion. Now, an individual who shows compassion towards you, helps you, cares for you, loves you, you will put your trust in them because that is a genuine, sincere emotion of wanting to help you. Well, God has demonstrated that over and over and over and again. He demonstrated it first and first foremost and second to none by sending his son to die on the cross when we were unlovable, when we were not even walking or acknowledging his existence. He still cares and loves us. He has compassion for each and every one of us. Somebody who loves and cares for you, who has compassion, you're going to put your trust in. God has demonstrated that quality as well. Another one is comp competency, the, the ability to do it. And if he's God, he can do anything. He is omnipotent. He's all powerful. And he has consistently, compassionately shown that. And fourth, to, to understand this concept of trust is communication. God is continuously communicating his love, his caring, his desire to have a relationship with us. You, you know the individual. You have or want a relationship with them. They're proving their trust over and over again. Obviously, Hezekiah, it says he trusts him. He has and recognizes God's consistency, his compassion, his, uh, his uh, competency. And obviously, he has some type of a relationship with him. He's established it. He's walking with God. He trusted in the Lord, verse 5 says the God of Israel, so that there was none like him among all the kings of Judah after him, nor among those who were before him. Wow, this man stepped up. He willingly chose to follow, believe, trust in God and do what was right. Verse six gives us a little bit more of, of, of his, his belief. And again, belief denotes action. It says, for he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him. Held fast, like hold on tight. I'm sure as a king, that's a tough job. And yet this man humbled himself and made God above his, his own kingship. And in doing so, acknowledged that he was dependent on him. He held tight to him. He denoted action. You and I would denote action by prayer. You and I would denote action by opening our Bibles and reading it. You and I would denote action by living it and doing by God's standard and not what we believe is right. Hezekiah did all these things. Verse 7, oh, I'm sorry, verse 6 continues, and following him, but kept the commandments that the Lord commanded Moses. Obviously, he read what Moses had written down. I mean, when we think of the commandments, we think of the Ten Commandments. But Deuteronomy speaks of so many different other things that the Israelites were to live and do and function as a lighthouse, as a testimony, as a voice of God to the rest of the nations. Uh, verse 7 says, and then the Lord was with him wherever he went out. Again, that communication, that relationship, and he prospered. He rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him. 
Verse 8, he struck down the Philistines as far as Gaza and its territories, from watchtower to fortified city. So not only was that action denote in his own livelihood, but he pushed against evil. He pushed against what everything represented God was against. Assyria was a growing nation, getting stronger and stronger with each passing year. And they have made, at this point in time, his father was basically giving homage to him. And Hezekiah said, done. And if you really want to stop and think that through, there are many consequences to that decision to stop serving Assyria and to, to go against the Philistines as well. But God was with him and he had the faith and the trust to no matter what the, the circumstance or whatever may happen, God he knew was with him. That gives us in that first section a character of this man, Hezekiah. Now the next section, uh, Joshua as well as Bill the last two weeks has talked about it. It was the northern kingdom. Hezekiah is in Judah, the southern kingdom. Remember, it's the, the, two, the nation of Israel is now divided. And Bill and Josh both address the issue that the northern kingdom is wiped out. They're done. Why? Uh, last week, I spoke, last Sunday, I spoke about Jehu, who came in and destroyed all the descendants of Ahab. There was so much wickedness, so much negativity toward God going on in that nation that God finally used the, um, the, the Assyrian nation to wipe them out, to take them captive. And verses 9 through 12 gives us a reminder, or again, a summary of what transpired there. And this is, we just saw in the first section of chapter 18, the example of a godly man following, doing what was right, trusting, pushing up against wickedness. Here we see the opposite. In verse 9, it says, In the fourth year of King Hezekiah, so while he was ruling, which was the seventh year of Hosea, the son of Elah, king of Israel, Salmanazar, king of Assyria, came up against Samaria and besieged it. And Bill and Josh, I think, both addressed that. And at the end of three years, he took it. In the sixth year of Hezekiah, which was the ninth year of Hosea, king of Israel, Samaria was taken. So Samaria, northern Israel. The king of Syria carried the Israelites away to Assyria and put them in Hela and on the harbor, the river of Gozan, and in the city of the Medes. So, Bill, again, Bill and Josh already addressed this. This is a summary. It's almost like contrasting, the writer is contrasting Hezekiah, his godliness versus the ungodliness of the kings of the northern uh, nation of Israel. And it tells us why in verse 12, why God judged them, why God took them away captive, why God dispersed them. Verse 12, because they did not obey the voice of the Lord, their God but transgressed his covenant and all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded. They neither listened nor obeyed. Now, interesting, it calls it their the Lord, their God. So obviously they know God. Obviously they have read the, 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 what Moses wrote in Deuteronomy, the Ten Commandments, all of what they're to do or not do. And it tells us that they chose not to obey it. So they heard it, they understood it, but they chose not to. They chose to do what was right in their own eyes. And so much, the flesh, the sin, the world can just get the best of us. We in our own hearts can think we're better than God or we are, or we are wiser than God. And we're gonna act on our own selfish, egotistical, prideful nature. They did. And God who is consistent, but God who is also long-suffering and patience, gave them more and more and enough time. He gave them more than enough warnings through the prophets, etc. But again, just like last Sunday when I said he used Jeho to say with Ahab, Ahab, done, he said done to this nation. God is consistent. God is also compassionate. They, it says, they transgressed his covenant. So they knew the promises, they knew the contract, they agreed to follow it, and yet they didn't. 
They transgressed it. They broke the covenant with God. They went beyond its boundaries. They did it their way, not God's way. And then, of course, they didn't listen or obey. So listening denotes someone speaking to you like the prophets. They heard it, but chose not to. We see two contrasts here, godly Hezekiah and the, the ungodly nation of Israel. Now, the next section, we find something interesting about Hezekiah. Verse 13, it says, In the 14th year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, that was the son of the previous king that took out uh, um, northern Israel, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah, that's Hezekiah's area, and took them. So Hezekiah pushed on that nation. The nation's pushing back. And that when we try to do right, mm, evil pushes back. Um, he, they, he, came after, he came after Hezekiah at Sennacherib with a vengeance. He took over, started one city, town after another, the fortified cities. Obviously, he's a very powerful king. He took them. Verse 14 says, And Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria, at Lachish, saying, I have done wrong, withdrawn from me. And this shows us something else about Hezekiah. But it also shows us something about it, which ourselves. We are not perfect individuals. Here was a godly man doing right. But so many times, and you and I, if we look in our past, can see situations where we doubt God. We're wondering, is God judging us? In this particular case, I mean, he knew what his father did as he said, now God is going to judge us for what my father, there's so much I'm sure he can play in his mind and it's happening. I have done wrong, withdraw from me. I mean, he's watching, sometimes so, so much fear can get into us as well and we don't think straight as he's watching uh, fortified town, city after other in Judah being taken by this Assyrian king. Whatever you impose on me, I will bear. And the king of Assyria required of Hezekiah, king of Judah, 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. And Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasuries of the king's house. Hezekiah is having a doubtful, fearful moment. At that time, Hezekiah stripped the gold from the doors of the temple of the Lord and from the doorpost, of the Hezek uh, doorpost that Hezekiah, king of Judah, had overlaid and given to the king of Assyria. I'm going to stop right there and Mark will pick up the rest of this story. The story goes, I think, another full chapter of what's going on. But the three sections I want you to see is a godly, a godly man, an ungodly nation, and a godly man that's not perfect. Mark will tell you and we'll see the God's hand upon this imperfect man. And when God, again, is a compassionate and shows much grace and mercy. But stop and take a moment yourself to think, where do I line up in all of this? Now, I can speak for myself and tell you I am not a perfect man. And that's why I chose to acknowledge a real and living God who has consistently shown himself throughout my walk with him, his love and his mercy and his grace. Have I messed up? Absolutely. And you know what? God keeps picking me up consistently. I like to think even in my weakness, even in my sinful nature, even in my justifying sometimes in my own mind, that in the, in the deep root of who I am, God is there. And I try not to beat myself up so much and God who I cry out to continuously talk to pray reassures me of his compassion and his love he acknowledges that I am not perfect I am a process of continuously growing in that grace and mercy I like to think I learn from my mistakes I acknowledge my mistakes. That's what King David did. Hezekiah is following in the footsteps of King David. His heart was right. But there are, again, so many different obstacles in this world that cause us to hesitate, falter. 
but God loves me. God died on the cross for me. God knows I'm not perfect. God knows the mistakes I'm going to make. And he continually comes alongside me and walks with me. I trust God. I try very hard to do what is right in his sight. At times I do hold on tight and I do not depart from him in my time of woes. And this I do know, that my, my God, my, my Jesus, saved me from my sins and that someday I will be a perfect human being in heaven with him forever and ever. Never lose hope of a consistent, compassionate, all-powerful God. Stay in his word. Read it. Do not depart from it. Pray. Talk to him continuously. Surround yourself with other people who love him as well. And just have that strong, solid ground to walk in as you walk with God. Yep, you will make mistakes. Hezekiah, a godly man, did. But again, I'm, I'm saving the rest of the story for Mark. God, God will rescue him. God will rescue any that cry out and call to him. Do that if you haven't. Do that if you don't know him. Just, it, it starts with a simple acknowledgement, a recognition of how much he does truly love us. And as a believer, yep, you're not gonna suddenly become perfect. Continually purpose in your heart to walk with him. Spend time with a loving, real, personal God and watch him work in your life. Be encouraged. God bless each and every one of you this day. Precious Lord, I lift up our listening audience all around the world. Lord, please continually remind them of your love, that compassion, of your consistency, of your, of your power, of the abilities that you have. We choose to believe in that type of a God who has, and you've demonstrated it again and again and again and again. We serve you, Lord. We worship you. And as always, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name, Lord, we cry out. To God be the glory. Amen. Mark's tomorrow. God bless. Take care.